Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I am joined with a very special guest. I have Daniel Ogden who is a professor and an author who has just written a book about werewolves in the ancient world. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me on your show. <laughs> of course, very excited to have you. We love talking all about books and anything to do with the ancient world. Um, and you have your new book coming out which is Werewolves in the Ancient World. Um, sure. Do you want to yeah. just tell us a little bit about the new book? Um, well, um, it may surprise your viewers that it's actually the first book devoted to the subject of werewolves in the ancient world. Um, really? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's an, an infinite number of, of books on werewolves. Um, uh, many of them are kind of, uh, well, you know, dodgy books. <laughs> Um, and as I said, there's nothing, nothing's focused on the ancient world. I mean, often general, general books on werewolves will start with a very quick reference to the ancient world, but there's been no systematic treatment um, of all the ancient evidence. Um, so you know, I would claim that the book's, the book, the book's a first in, in, in that way. So, I mean, and what does, what does the book um, principally do? Well, it, it obviously it, it attempts to understand the ancient evidence in itself, and to, to to make make sense of you know the way werewolfism was thought about in the ancient world. Um, but probably the most important um, uh, contribution is to try to relate the ancient evidence to um, the more recent evidence, and by the more recent evidence, I actually mean the medieval evidence. I mean, in, so in, in the so in the twelfth century AD. There's a, a sudden upsurge in werewolf stuff, um, really? particularly in cool. yeah, in yes, in Anglo-French literature, in French literature, in in Norse literature, mm. um, and from then on, there's a continuous tradition. A lot of things change in quite a big way in the early modern period, but nonetheless, there's a continuous tradition. So the werewolves that we enjoy today, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, there's a there's a complete there's a, a fully direct link back to the werewolves that we enjoyed back in the the um, uh, the 12th century um, AD. Um, now the ancient evidence um, spans uh, well. It depends. You one could debate about when it starts, but uh, um, uh, one could even find it in Homer, so in the seventh century BC, uh, and it petered out with Augustine more or less in about 400 AD. Um, okay. So the interesting thing is, what's going on in that gap between 800, sorry, between, sorry, between 400 um, AD and the 12th century? You know, so there's yeah. sort of like 700 years, 800 years. What, what's going on when we have almost complete radio silence on werewolves in that period? Um, and so, and so, well, there are two obvious hypotheses really one one hypothesis is um that um people in the um 12th century um uh were reading their ancient texts and suddenly got were interested in werewolves again and and started it all up restarted it all and uh, so um you know that's perfect that's, that's a perfectly you know, reasonable suggestion the other alternative mm -hmm. the more interesting alternative is that basically werewolves are deeply embedded in folklore. Europe, I'm going to say European folklore, let's not worry about other parts <laughs> of the world. But deeply embedded in European folklore, and they always were, and they popped up, as it were, for a few centuries in the ancient world, and then, you know, during the Dark Ages, they went underground again, as it were, um, and then popped up um, more or less as they had been back in the 12th century AD. Um, and my argument is um, that actually that second hypothesis, the more interesting one, is the right one. Actually, that um, that um, that um, you know there there are sort of if you, if you read the ancient sources very very carefully, there are all sorts of subtle hints about a sort of an underlying folklore folkloric culture, which then become very loudly and clearly represented in the wealth culture uh, from the twelfth century onwards. Right. Um, and they're not they're, those subtle hints are not the sort of things that you would expect, as it were, the, the authors of the 12th century to sort of pick up on and sort of right. run with no ball they'd pick up and run with. Really, the, but those, those little hints are, I think, early indications of the of the, of the, of the folklore um, that, uh, that that uh, that they themselves are going to be reusing all those centuries later.
So we don't necessarily know where the myth has originated from. Has it? Did it sort of just turn up? No, we no, we don't. We don't know where it comes from. Um, again, and that also is, is you know uh, a matter for debate. So, um, what other people would say, and many of the other people that work on werewolves, they would say something like this. Um, they would say that werewolf, the notion of werewolfism, um, is a is a a projection of ideas about um, uh, uh, young sort of bands of young warriors. Okay, right. so it's an anthropological idea that many ancient and indeed you know more modern societies um, have this culture of um, uh, putting you know tr transitional use youths um you know maturing youths into a certain kind of warrior group um in the ancient world they would have been sort of typically sort of light armed warriors who are sort of who are um sent off to the borders of a community to patrol patrol the borders rather than the heavy armed sort of serious soldiers um and anyway anyway, anyway they would argue that there are many societies that have these these sorts of uh, this this sort of uh, warrior uh, sort of young warrior tradition, and that were, werewolves are a way of thinking about, as it were, young men becoming these sorts of slightly wild, undisciplined uh, warriors of the margins. I don't believe that myself. I mean, I should say it's a, you know it's, it's a very interesting case. It's a, you know, it's got it's a good luck going for it. Um, but for me, I'm always folklore first. Um, I don't think that the werewolf grew out of, shall I say, a social practice or a cultural practice like that. I think werewolves belong in stories. Um, the home yeah. of the werewolf is the campfire horror story, and always was. Um, and it's a, it's a very striking, um, powerful idea in itself, um, which is then used, I would say, is then used metaphorically. By societies in different ways and indeed this notion of the the youthful warrior band is one sort of um thing that the the the, the pre-existing notion of the werewolf can be can be associated with but there are other things too it can be associated for example with ideas of disease for example you know so um and we find both of those in in the, in the ancient world yeah, I mean, I guess when you're talking, when you're thinking about youths turning into men, there's a lot of other wild animals you could have potentially used that yes. might have been more appropriate than wolves. Like it doesn't necessarily strike me as something you have to use a wolf for. Um, so that, mm. so your hypothesis makes a lot of sense. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, but that, that, that is a, <laughs> but that that is a good, but you that is a good question, isn't it? Um, I mean, looking across cult, looking across all the werewolf cultures why why wear wolves and not yeah. you know as in as in that wonderful movie why not wear rabbits <laughs> you know <laughs> for example um i think one one I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to talk about sort of universal features of werewolves um uh you know going beyond the notion of a man turning into a wolf and possibly turning back again and you know i'm reluctant to sort of add any more to it Mm -hmm. to, 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 you know, to our basic definition of, of the concept. But um, one thing that is really quite pervasive in the ancient evidence and in the medieval evidence, and indeed possibly even in quite a lot of the early modern evidence, um, is this notion of um, into the woods. This phrase, into the woods, recurs so often. So a man turns into a wolf and he runs off into the wolf. It's like into the woods, rather. Into the woods. Um, occasionally, occasionally, a man runs off into the woods and then becomes a wolf. But there's there's always this always this notion. Um, you know, I mean, well, obviously, the, the title of that uh, recent Stephen Sondheim musical was was very very well chosen. You know, and the, the, yeah. the sort of you know to be symbolic of you know our folk folkloric history. Um, but um, the so, so so and I do think that that does um, relate to something fundamental, mainly may, may, maybe about 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 the werewolf, um, and that is that it's that the werewolf embodies this 
transition between or opposition between or combination of or negotiation of um if that's not too scholastic sorry <laughs> um no, you know, right. the civilized the civilized human on the one hand and the wild animal um on the other um mm. now one can see if one, if one gets to that point one can see that maybe there is some sort of sense in choosing a wolf because um you, you, you there are senses in which wolves might be considered the the ultimate wild animal um uh, I think another factor is actually that wolves are, I mean, very, very broadly, wolves are just about, can be imagined to be sort of human size, at least the bigger ones can be. Um, you can sort of, it's, it's easy to imagine sort of a transition between a human and a wolf in a way that it isn't easy to imagine a transition between a, a human and a, well, I don't rabbit. know. Yes, a, well, a rabbit, <laughs> a rabbit, indeed. you know. Um, so it's like they've chosen the animal the closest to themselves, like to, to people. And I guess the the dichotomy between civilized man and wild man goes back so far as well. Like you think of the Epic of Gilgamesh, you've got Gilgamesh and Enkidu, oh, yeah, and yes, they both yeah. sure. balance each other with the civilized and the they learn something from each other. So do you that's think that's a very that, good point? Yeah, that's a very good point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this continuous history, did it alter very much between so I know we've had that dark period and it's very like is it was just was it just the the idea of the man turning into the wolf, going to the woods and then turning back into a man, or did was there specific points that changed? Um, right. Uh well, um the notion of the man who sort of recurringly changes into a wolf which i think is many people would consider to be fair sort of fairly integral to more, the modern yep. idea of the wolf yeah. That, think, <laughs> yeah 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 ah well that's that's another thing um, <laughs> um that probably does i think start so far as our evidence is concerned start in the medieval period with the medieval stuff um also i should say really get going with the medieval stuff it's not necessarily typical of the way werewolves were thought about in the ancient world. However, there is the ancient world has one particularly sort of corking story uh, about a werewolf, and this is this is told by Petronius. Maybe actually, maybe it's, it'd be useful for your viewers if I just summarise summarise this story. I mean, it's a, by all one, means, the, please. You know, it's a, the one good one from the ancient world. Um, okay, so um, this story is told in. Um, uh petronius's novel the satirican um there's a penguin classic devoted to it which people can can access easily and it's a sort of you know regular sized book but you have to know that in fact it's only about a seventh of the original that survives even though it's like a full-length book for us um wow. the seventh that survived yes yeah, so it was an awful long novel um <laughs> in origin um um and um uh so we have we have more or less a uh, amongst the, the sort of the seventh of it we have we have a, a, a good big chunk continuous chunk which is the story of a dinner party given by a sort of rather grotesque um nouveau riche person super rich nouveau riche person called Trimalchio. he's an he's an ex-slave a so-called freedman um and he's completely uneducated but likes to boast of his education and so he gets all his myths wrong and things like that. um but anyway, at one point in, in the dinner party, uh, he and one of his fellow freedmen called Nicaros exchange to, um, well, I would say, I've used this phrase again, a phrase already, they exchange two campfire horror stories. Um, and uh, and they're both really good. They're both really great stories. And Nicaros's story is about a werewolf. So he's, he tells um, a story from his, supposedly from his past when he was still a slave himself. Mm -hmm um and um despite being a slave he had a girlfriend who who who, who had a pub and, um and he decided to go off to visit her one night um or else at the time the, the time the timing of it is all a bit vague um but um seemingly he's, set, he's setting off during the night and um um, his his master has a soldier friend staying with him, and the soldier decides to come along just for the just for the trip, supposedly. 
Um, and so they're, they're so all they're, there they are walking down the road, and it's one of those roads like the Via Appia still is actually. If you if you see that archaeological site, it's a it's a road a road that's lined lined with tombs. I mean, often cemeteries were strung out along the sides of roads in in in, in uh, Roman times. Wow. Um, and uh, at one point, um, the soldier stops to have a pee against against <laughs> the tombs. Not very respectful. No, um, not very at all. And, <laughs> and Nicaros, um, I sort of, you know, whatever, standing with his hands in his pockets, as it were, and whistling no doubt at the same time. Uh, well, he turns back and he sees that the the the, 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 the soldier has actually taken all his clothes off and piled them up. Um, and then he he pees around the, the clothes in a circle. Um, and turns himself into a wolf and runs off. Okay, um, so Nicholas goes to the pile of clothes to you know either to retrieve them, keep them safe, see what's going on, and finds that they've been turned to stone. So this this peeing in a circle was clearly very magical, okay, mm -hmm. and it's clearly designed to protect clothes. Um, anyway, so he's terrified now. He's terrified, and um, of course, he's, he's, he's in a road of tombs anyway. But he imagines himself being attacked by ghosts from all sides as he runs on and finally gets to his girlfriend's house. Um, and uh, I say the, the pub also is also clearly a, a farm as well. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and his girlfriend tells him, Well, you know, um, uh, you know, you should have been here earlier. Because a wolf got in amongst the sheep and was was just butchering them, but one of our one of our slaves um, uh, put a, a spear through his neck, um, and so he ran off with his neck wound. Um, anyway, and uh, so uh, the next morning, um, uh, Nicholas is on his way back back home, and as he passes the tombs where the clothes were left, those are gone. And there's, there's, but there's blood. And when he finally gets home, he finds his soldier friend lying in bed uh, with a doctor tending to his neck wound. So, oh. so, uh, and, so and at that point, I realised he was a werewolf. You might have thought, well, maybe you might, you might have realised that when you saw him turn into a wolf. But nonetheless, um, uh, uh, and, and, and he says, and then I refuse to to break bread with him ever again. Um, so that's a great story, um, and it yeah, has, that's awesome. Right, I should also, I should also have said, by the way, um, that uh, yeah, there's a full moon whilst this is going on. So that notion of the full moon, or at least at least uh, maybe maybe we said that the, maybe it says that the, the moon is is brightly shining. Maybe not a full moon, but you know, if you want it to be still, a full moon, it's a full moon, and uh, you can you know, still you, references the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As if there was an so, importance of it. Yeah, sure. So. Um, so that is a great story, isn't it? And um, there are a number of important ideas in it. Well, well actually, it is quite interesting that uh, the guy says that he only realises he's a werewolf um, when he finds him in bed with the neck wound, the identifying wound. That is a very common theme, again, in the in the later medieval and European stories, um, the identifying wound. Um, and I think you can, you, you, you can see the... Um, the force of it as a motif already in the ancient world, because, uh, as I just made clear, that the, the, it's illogical, really, in the in, it, in in the context of the Petronius story. Of course, he knew that he was a werewolf when he saw him transform, but that but that is such a clearly already such a fundamental, well-established motif. You rec you recognise mm. a werewolf by by an identifying wound um, that that gets stuck into the story anyway. So it's interesting, isn't it? How even though we only have that one one really good story of this sort, these sort of little inconsistencies and stray details sort of open up, sort of receding vistas of, of folklore behind it. Um, uh, and the, the other the other point that, 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 that to comment on there, of course, is the the, the importance of keeping the clothes um, safe. Um, it's not the, the motif isn't explained any further. In, context, in, in the ancient context, but it doesn't need to be, actually. Um, it's obvious, isn't it? Why does a werewolf need to keep his clothes safe? Well, well, we can easily guess that that's because he needs his clothes if he's going to turn back into a human. Absolutely. So, so the clothes somehow, the, the, so this, it doesn't quite, again, it doesn't quite work you know, logically, but the clothes are, again, the civilized outer carapace of the human. 
um, which is somehow so which somehow needs to to, to to put back on. So there's a notion that there's, the, there's a werewolf inside, I guess, which is released mm -hmm. when the when the, the civilized outer carapace is taken off. Um, and that notion of keeping the clothes safe, um, because you depend on them to turn back into a into a human, that becomes very um, very much more um very very much more developed in the medieval stuff it's interesting because um, i feel like werewolves in pop culture like nowadays that doesn't get explained like you you see in a movie someone just like rips oh, yeah. through their clothes and turns into werewolf. you're like yeah. okay are they going to come back when you turn back into a man or do you have to walk home naked like what's going to happen yes sure this yes, doesn't fine. get explained you have to buy yeah, more yeah. t-shirts every yeah. week <laughs> yeah sure yes yeah yeah um so there's a there's a that, there's that awkward identification isn't there between the clothes on the one hand and the human skin on on the other you know sort of they're sort of the same but they're not the same it's uh mm. it's again there's a sort of an awkward sort of logical glide there um and i think it, another thing that's worth saying about that story is and actually this is the reason i to begin to tell it um is that it, although we only see him transform into a wolf once um, it does. It is clearly um, uh, assumed by the story that this is something that recurs. Um, again, why? And again, again, that that final that final line. I refused ever to share bread with him again. Clearly, because he fears it might happen again, and he might get eaten by mm. the wolf. So, so the, the, the no, there is the notion there that the werewolfism is what you might call cyclical. Um, you know, it's not just like a one-off transformation or anything. Um, so, and that 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 idea is very important, I think, to modern ideas of, of the werewolf, isn't it? And uh, um, so there you go. So it's all it all starts there. Because the fact that he's like Peter and his clothes, he's obviously aware of what he has to do. So you can oh, only sure, assume yeah. that he's done before. Yes, and of course, it. Uh, I yeah. mean, it, it also implies that a, a werewolf has some sort of magical powers as well. You know, we can't all just pee around our clothes and turn them to stone. <laughs> so. Were they seen as negative or were they revered in cultures? Was it a positive thing to have right. a werewolf um, around? <laughs> yes, well, um, as, as just as you were saying, there's so many interpretations. Um, already in the, in, in the ancient world, um, um, I mean, a number of the references just seem to be quite neutral, strangely. <laughs> um, it was there. It just um, existed. It's yes. I mean, sometimes we hear of... We hear of sorcerers or witches turning themselves into wolves, um, mm -hmm. and probably that's about just about as good as as good or as bad as the sorcerer or the witches. I mean, mm -hmm. the the witches in the ancient world tended to be bad, so yeah, I think we can say those those are bad werewolves. <laughs> um, um, and the so they weren't the always skin. men. Sorry, sorry. So obviously they weren't always men. Oh yes, that's a very good question. Yeah, the the one. The one uh, batch of evidence relating to women turning themselves into wolves is again does relate to to witches, and that's pretty much confined. I think I'm right in saying to to Roman poetry, uh, Latin poetry, um, mainly elegiac poetry. Actually, um, some indication possibly of that in in Apuleius's novel, but um, yeah. So so there are yes there are that, that is an important point. There are female werewolves. In the ancient world um um so um and i mentioned so i mentioned the ghost in the wolf skin clearly he's a bad guy um <laughs> he has to be dealt with by an appropriate hero um but there are there are also ostensibly good guys too um um so again it's a story it's, you one's got to sort of work hard to reconstruct it really from um references to it in Pliny and Pausanias. A chap called either Demarcus or Deminatus mm -hmm. um, uh, was turned into a, a, a wolf um, in Arcadia. Now, um, yeah. he, again, the, the story is, is told in such an elusive way, it's difficult to reconstruct it, but what seems to have happened is, and this is my this is my guess anyway, um, he was attending um, the sacrifice of Zeus Lycaios, Wolfie Zeus, on Mount Lycaion, Mount Wolfie. Um, and an enemy, a personal enemy, I suppose, slipped some human flesh 
uh, into his portion of the sacrifice. So obviously you know, the, the, the animal sacrifice is shared out and people eat it in the usual way. But somehow some human flesh is slipped in and he eats this, I guess, unknowingly. Yeah. Um, uh, again, well, what, you know, this is what wolves do. I mean, you know, the wolves, they, they eat they eat people supposedly. So, so it's quite appropriate that, that actually eating human flesh should be regarded um, as a way of transforming somebody into a wolf. Um, and this isn't the only evidence for that. But anyway, so having done that, he was turned into a wolf for a period of, I think, something like nine years. Um, and well, we're not told how he, how he managed to transform back. Um, um, I don't know if there was a special way or maybe, as it were, he just sort of contracted a, cur a nine year curse, as it were, by eating the flesh. And so that was it. Um, and but after that, he became a very distinguished Olympic victor, supposedly. Uh, and uh, so um, I think there's, there's no indication that he was, well, there's no strong indication that he was a bad guy. Okay, he seems to have been a good guy. And certainly he ended up as a good guy. Um, so so you can have, you can have the good werewolf. And, uh, and, uh, and, again, and again, I think he was sort of a, a victim of deceit. And that's, a, that's actually a, a theme with, again, these, those early medieval werewolves as well. They, 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 they tend to be, victims of deceit in some way they tend to be the good guy who's who is who is uh cheated in, in some way right okay that's interesting because i guess when you think about werewolves nowadays you get both good and bad werewolves in stories sure. so it's, it's yeah. never clear yeah. sure um sure yeah i was wondering where does the word the english word werewolf come from the um well it used to be said and actually, this is a sort of a notion that I used to have. I don't know where I got it from. Um, that, um, well, given that we know what a werewolf is, people are all obviously going to take the word werewolf and say, well, I know that the second bit means wolf. So where must mean man. It must mean man-wolf, mustn't it? Um, and actually, the first person to give, an, give us an etymology of the word is Gervais of Tilbury. Uh, again, back in the 12th century B AD, very, very important mm -hmm. century. And he does, in fact, say that's, well, that's how the word works. Um, uh, and he says that the wear element is derived from the Latin wear, man, as in virile, okay. wear. So it does mean wear, wolf. Um, but now, um, more originally, um, etymologists and sort of werewolf scholars um, have really begun to dispute and uh, most typically, they say that it derives from um, a Germanic word. The, the first element derives from a Germanic word um, like wearg. It again, it appears in various different forms, um, which means literally strangler or criminal of some sort. Um, well, mm, again, if you look at the look, you look at the uses of this word uh, in English and in Scandinavian contexts um the, the the notion of wolf of wolfiness is already often attached to that word um and in and indeed actually it gives the modern swedish word varg which actually is the standard word for wolf in swedish right <laughs> so it seems to me it seems to me that we just need to think about the history of that word in a different way um and i think we have to sort of lay aside this sort of this I think the, the innovative meaning is the strangler meaning, and probably in origin, that word did always mean wolf or something like a wolf. Um, so in, so in, if that's the case, then werewolf literally means not man-wolf, but wolf-wolf. <laughs> now, you might think, well, that's not logical, is it? Why should it mean wolf-wolf? Um, well, I just think we have to imagine the context where um, you know, whatever you've just you've just seen your man turn into a wolf, and you're saying, "Look, it's a wolf! It's a wolf! It's a wolf! It's a wolf!" <laughs> you know, I think I think that's that's the point of it. Yeah, it's a wolf. It's really a wolf. It's really a wolf. It is. Yeah. So that that that's Very my cool. suggestion for the origin of the English word. Yeah. Was there a word for it in Greek? Um, the Greek that's a, that is a, that, Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, I'm going to say no, uh, at least not in, not originally. Now, um, 
again, your viewers will probably be familiar with the word lycanthropy. Mm -hmm. And they'll think of that as being a fancy word for werewolfism, which is when that's what it is indeed these days. And it's made up, <laughs> well, it's just the other way around, but it's just like, as it were, the traditional understanding of werewolf in that the like part, the look, look, looking Greek mean, means wolf, and anthrope means man. Again, you, you know, anthropology, etc. You know. Um, so, but the thing about that word is, although it's a, it is a, a genuine ancient Greek word, at least from the, the AD period onwards. Um, it only seems to be applied to um, what you might call the medical reflex of werewolfism. That is to say, it's, right. it's, it's used to define a disease um, where I talk again, I talked about werewolfism being used in, in all sorts of metaphorical contexts, and this is one of them. Um, so again, there's a the ancients developed this notion. Uh, it's clearly it's what we would call some sort of we would regard it as some sort of mental illness or some kind of severe depression or something these days. But anyway, the, mm -hmm. the, the victims of, who, who contract werewolfism, lycanthropia, um, um, become listless and they're said to roll around amongst tombs and things like that, just hang 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 out <laughs> um, um, amongst the tombs. That association you see between werewolves and the dead, and the werewolves and the tombs, um, mm. and um, so so there also there is that although there is that term, it's really spe specific specifically for, as it were, the metaphorical werewolf condition of, of this yeah. disease, um, and it does eventually. But you know we're well into the Byzantine period before the word the word seems to be applied to sort of what you might call proper werewolves. You know. um, right. um, yeah, and in Latin, and Latin doesn't have a word either. It could be well, right. there is a word, and I mean, if you may, if you recall the Petronius story, I, I the punchline of that story is I realised he was a werewolf, and I refused to eat with him again. But the word actually used is versipellis, uh, which actually means skin changer, okay, or I suppose okay. say shape shape shifter. Yeah, something like that. So arguably, the word has a broader use. Um, mm -hmm. um, although, well, that's, well, that's one, well, one argument is that it has a broader use. Um, another argument is that despite its literal meaning, it was used in a specialized way to mean specifically werewolves. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, maybe it was. Maybe it was, yeah. who knows? I will actually have another book um, coming out. Um, in the summer, I'm not sure exactly when, probably about the midsummer, you know, June, July, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, an, I've, I've written two books on dragons already. This is another one. I get, I get, it's called The Dragon so in the cool. West. And again, it's taking the story of the dragon from, from the, just the same way, really, from the ancient world into the medieval world. Thank you so much for joining me today um, and for talking with me and Ancient History Encyclopedia. We're going to link below where you can purchase your new book all about werewolves. It's already out in Britain and it comes out on the 7th of March for Australia and US. And there's a new book coming out in the middle of the year as well, all about dragons. So keep your eye out for that as well. Um, thank you so much for coming along and chatting to us today. Thank you. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. World History Encyclopedia is a not-for-profit organisation. If you'd like to support our work, hit the support link up in the corner of the screen or via the support link down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon.